Chat with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. She is many things, and neither shy nor dull are among them. Quite the contrary. For most of her life, Barbara Emil provoked strong reactions in person and in her columns. Tonight, she's with us for a feature interview on her fascinating new memoir, which, quite frankly, is an exercise in, as the expression goes, kicking ass and taking names. Then we'll consider the huge pivot that food producers and grocers undertook to meet our pandemic era appetites. It's Wednesday, October 21st, and that's next on the agenda. She's been called many things in her many years in the public eye. It girl, socialite, editor, author, baroness, columnist, wife, four times on that one actually. Barbara Emile's new autobiography is a surprisingly self-deprecating look at a life lived in the spotlight, occasionally a very harsh spotlight. The 600-pager is called Friends and Enemies, a memoir, and it brings Barbara Emile to our airwaves tonight from the provincial capital. So nice to see you. Thank you so much. Terrific to be here. You and I, we've only met once. We, we barely know each other, but uh, I thoroughly love this book, and I know you a lot better now. So shall we dive in? Let's, let's dive right in. Well, uh, let's just start with this. You know, you did say in the book you were quite reluctant to write your memoirs. And uh, I guess I want to know, for starters, what propelled you to finally say yes and do it? Um, I was reluctant because I always find the memoirs of people who haven't lived particularly extraordinary lives or accomplished something extraordinary rather boring. And you get these incredible anecdotes. Um, that really mean nothing. And that was my genuine reluctance. I didn't think I'd done enough with my life to write a memoir. What propelled me was that I am a writer, basically, and a journalist. And we use every writer, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, uses something of their own life for their writing. Um, even someone like Murakami, who wrote The Wind-Up Bird and Japanese Magic Realism. The part of their own life goes into the book. And so much was happening around me that it was partly a need to have a thread to sanity. And it was partly a need to understand, as I have said before, was I really as horrible as everyone was saying? Because I don't think people keep saying you're horrible if you're not. I mean... Not the, you know, sort of a hundred journalists can't be making up the fact that you're horrible. There must be something there. So I decided to sit down and write. Well, let's go, let's go through some of the story and then we can let our viewers decide one way or another how horrible you are, okay? <laughs> um, I do want to go back to England. As your accent suggests, you are from England originally. Not a well-to-do home. And two parents, if I can put it this way, who were, who were clearly troubled people. How did you sort of manage your way through your childhood? I do think that in those days, which was the late 1940s and 50s, that you children really thought about whether their parents were troubled or not or whether their life was extraordinary or not. You just got on with it. So when, my, when I came home from school one day in Hamilton, Ontario, and I think I was about 14, and my things were packed in a cardboard box. I didn't put this in the book because it sounded just too ghastly dramatic. And, and I knew that I wasn't going to be staying at home any longer. I just thought that that was a wise decision of my stepfather's because my mother reacted very neurotically to my presence and I didn't want to upset him or her anymore. And from that point on, Steve, you just, you just carry on. You find jobs. To support yourself. You look at the positive things in your life. No rules, no parents to tell you when to come home, what jobs you can or cannot take. Mm. And I think that in this country, in Canada, you can always find a job. I grant you that it might be more difficult at 14 and 15 today than it was then because there are labor laws. But I could get jobs um, in department stores, I could collect pop bottles, I could do anything. Today I'd probably go and get a job at Amazon or something like that in a delivery room where I'd wash dishes. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't unpleasant. I didn't sit home and cry. Well, um, okay, I got to follow up on that then because because I'm imagining you at the age of 
I don't know what you were, 15 maybe, when your mother called you and said, your mother said this to you, your father's dead, he killed himself, he went mad, I expect you'll go mad too. I mean, what does one think when one's mother says that? You know, the problem with doing interviews like this is that I have shut my mind to a lot of this. And after we finish this interview, I will go into a corner and probably cry. Um, I remember that moment very well. I was living in the house of a garage mechanic, and he said, there's a telephone call for you downstairs. And I loved my father very much. And my whole life was centered around in earning enough money to go back to England and be with him and be Jewish again, actually. Um, and all I could do was think, oh, my father's dead. What? What would one do if one's father was dead? And I sort of had that ability to distance myself from anything unpleasant. And so I left the garage mechanic's house and I went for a long walk on this cold, I think it was March day, um, trying to assimilate it. And I did. And I thought, now I have to change the direction. I won't be going back to England. There's no one there to go back to. So I must just get on with doing the best I can in Canada. And what that meant for you was eventually getting into journalism. You were on the cover of Toronto Life magazine, its first ever issue, I think. I wonder whether at the time you can recall being, well, don't take this the wrong way. You were young, gorgeous, on the cover of magazines, trying to make it in a male-dominated world of journalism. How was, how was negotiating your way around all that? How did that work? Again, there must be something very wrong with me because I never felt that there was any kind of a glass ceiling, any kind of a problem with men. And perhaps that's the good thing about my childhood because all the women in my family worked back for three generations. Um, it, being on the cover of Toronto Life was not journalism. That was just straightforward picture taking. Um, but getting into journalism, there were a couple of moments when I was working for the CBC and I discovered that I was getting less pay than the man I was training for my job. And I was really irritated with that. So I went in and said to the producer, this is wrong. And he said, well, he has a family to support and you don't. And I thought about it and I saw the logic in that. Um, I never had any difficulty, Steve, in work, if you just work hard, and I, I appreciate, I'm not saying it was okay for me, so it's okay for everyone else. I'm just saying that in my case, if you worked really hard, you, you got where you wanted to get. Hmm. And I did work hard. I played, but I worked very, very hard. Well, I, I have to say, you don't pull any punches, never mind I'm talking about other people, but in, in particular, when you talk about yourself, you are very tough on yourself in this book. And one thing I learned, which I did not know before, is that uh, Lord Black of Cross Harbor is your fourth husband. I didn't know about three marriages before him, and, and all of them evidently too problematic to get to the finish line. Now, do you regard those marriages today as mistakes? I don't, you know, I, I am incredibly philosophical, and I don't mean to be philosophical, but I just don't think you can redo your life and you learn from something. I found my third marriage incredibly destructive and painful and I rather wish I hadn't had to go through that um, but it taught me a lot I was alone in England married to an absolutely charming intelligent man this David, is David Graham. Graham yes yes and he was a 47 year old bachelor when I married him he had everything that a man you could want in a man funny charming intelligent good looking successful and there was probably a reason which i should have thought of why he had never married at 47. it was a mistake in one sense because it almost destroyed me not quite i'm just too tough for that um but it got me back to england and I really wanted to go back to England, not because I didn't appreciate what Canada had done for me. In terms of journalism, um, even though my writing wasn't liked in certain areas, uh, Canada had been good for me. But getting back to England where David Graham was now resident was the positive side of what came out of our marriage. And then because he was never around and I was alone, I had to try and reinvent myself in terms of English journalism. I didn't think I had a prayer because I'd been reading English columnists all my life and I thought they were far too clever and witty and erudite for me. But again, I was lucky. I worked and I got my first assignment at the Times. 
on a Canadian topic because nobody else wanted to write about Brian Mulroney coming to England. Um, and it went from there. Well, what, what's fascinating about this, and people won't know this about you, you actually, despite having married two fairly well-off guys, and David Graham was a rich man, you did not divorce well, I have to say. You, you, you didn't come away with these marriages with very much money at all. And you get into some very... Look, I'm sorry for bringing this up here, but you do talk about it in the book. You talk about an abortion that you had decades ago. And you write in the book, I did not know this would be my single chance at having a child. And I wonder all these years later whether you regret that decision all those decades ago. I do regret it. I regret it deeply. But you know, if I lived my life again, I think I would be um, as foolish again. When you're a young woman, and I was a young woman, and I was, you know, hell-bent on, on getting a career. And at that time, I didn't have much of a job. I was the secretary to the head of uh, public affairs or something. I mean, it was, a, it was a secretarial job. And I thought a child is something I can't support and it'll get in my way. I think if somebody had told me there was a way out, it could be adopted or they could help me financially, I might have had it, but probably not. Um, I would have done exactly the same thing. Do I regret it now? deeply. But I'm not really, I can't beat myself up on it because I know I'd do it again. Um, I always say to Conrad, you know, I'll die and there won't be anybody to remember me. And there'll be no children to sort of hang around me as I become increasingly infirm. And I won't see the world through their eyes. I'd love to see the world through the eyes of grandchildren, for example, um, because you see new things all the time. But that's just a part of life that was part of the price you pay for being as selfish as I was and as, as self-obsessed and driven. Hmm. You mentioned Conrad, Conrad Black, your husband, and, um, <laughs> well, I'm going to read this quote. Conrad Black hadn't the faintest idea that, for me, he was emblematic of stuffed shirt Toronto. Now, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement for a guy you're about to marry. So what changed? No, I wasn't about to marry him. Let's be fair. <laughs> this was when I was editor of the Toronto Sun. I was living in, in um, Canada. And I, wasn't, I was trying to get out of the lunch with Conrad, actually, um, because he was emblematic for me of what Peter Newman called the Canadian establishment. And I was never interested in businessmen. Um, I much preferred uh, European intellectuals, that sort of man. Um, I went only because my publisher, Doug Creighton, insisted I go. And I thought also he was far too clever for me. I knew that Conrad used lots of long words and he'd make references to history. And although I have an honours BA and did some graduate work, I never took the kind of courses that counted. And history is a course that counts in life. I took philosophy. You can't really use Hegel and Nietzsche as dinner table or lunch table conversation. So I was frightened of going to lunch with Conrad. And I knew he'd drink, and I didn't drink. And I'd seen establishment people when they were drinking, and I, I just didn't want that. He was very pleasant. At the end of the lunch, I thought, Phew, I got through it. <laughs> um, but that, that was it. And he was married. And Whatever else I am, I would never date a married man. I just wouldn't. And indeed, when Conrad many years, or quite a few years later, first asked me out, um, I thought he was still married to his first wife. And it wasn't until I was satisfied he was legally separated and she was with someone else that we began dating. I mean, there's, if you've been an outsider in some ways, the last thing you want to do is be the outsider with a married man whose loyalty is to his wife and family. Indeed. Now, at some point, he does ask you to marry him. And you, again, you tell us in the book, at that point, when he proposed, you two had not even so much as kissed. Now, did you find that a bit odd? Well, I thought it was extraordinary, very strange. I wondered if there was something wrong with him. Um, and. I, I, I actually, I couldn't understand his proposal because I liked Conrad by that point. You know, we've been seeing each other because I knew he needed people. He was lonely. His wife and children were gone. When he proposed, he used so many literary terms and so many allusions that I wasn't quite sure whether he was asking me to have an affair or what he was doing. Um, 
And then I told him to go to a psychiatrist because clearly he was asking me to marry him on the rebound and that was not a good thing for him. And he did go to a psychiatrist, the head of the Tavistock Institute. And then it took, I suppose it took a few months of me gradually realizing that there was so much more to him, that I could let down my guard, I could see the real Conrad. And it was, um, it was quite a romance. Well, the book is, is deeply personal about you, of course, but it's also deeply personal about him in some areas. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether or not, I mean, I assume you gave him this manuscript to look at and gave him a bit of a veto on stories that he thought were over the line. Did that happen? No. No. no, I wouldn't let him see the manuscript until it was in third page galleys, at which point there's no turning back. Huh. And, um, the reason was not because I think he would have vetoed anything. Conrad is an extraordinarily tolerant man. I mean, if, if I sat down and said to him, um, Conrad, I think I'll try taking some cocaine tonight, he would say, fine, uh, that's all right, Barbara, I'll be here to look after you, but I myself cannot do that. I mean, that's a silly example, but he's just an immensely tolerant man. And I knew he wouldn't veto anything in the book, but at the same time, I thought some things might upset him. Not the revelations of my sexual escapades or my view of him, but the way I handled his difficulties. I was afraid he might feel I'd handled them incorrectly. Well, let's pick up on that, since that's, uh, th that dovetails us nicely to where we want to go. Let us, uh, I guess, okay, we'll establish the following. You, uh, we talked about the fact you didn't divorce, quote unquote, well in the past, and therefore you came to your marriage with L uh, Lord Black with, with very little money, and suddenly you've got this quite wonderful lifestyle, and, uh, and you do, we should say, you don't shy away from the most famous quote you ever uttered in the book to that Vogue magazine reporter, I have an extravagance that knows no bounds. But I want to read an excerpt from the book now, and then we'll come back and, and I'll ask a question on the other side of it. As it was, you write, I sat listing our errors and our offenses as honestly as I could to make sense of it all. I clearly had an offensive, smug, and abrasive personality. We had been too blatant in our enjoyment of what Conrad calls the preferments of his position. There were just too many photos, too many pictures of us enjoying ourselves all over the place with important people. Hear Conrad on the radio, see Conrad being made a peer and complaining about the loss of his citizenship. See Barbara prancing around on the social pages of the New York Times. Read her fey comments about extravagance and clothes that gave Conrad's enemies an open sesame. People were simply tired of us, tired of our being and our bloody self-importance in the pronouncements we made verbally or in print. I, I, I guess I want to pick up from that and say, do you think that a lot of the eventual very zealous prosecution of him by law enforcement authorities was in part, you know, because of... What you Me. two, well, okay, you. I wasn't going to say it, but you just said it. Yes. No, no, I mean, let's not shy away from it. And before I answer that, I'll say that I'm having some difficulty with publicizing this book because I'm afraid the same, um, the same loop will start again. There's too much of me. Um, pushing this book. There's too much of me on television. So it's it's getting increasingly painful to do these interviews. I'm just afraid of starting that off again. Um, I think that Conrad would probably have had to go through the same awful times again without me, but I think that I started it off and made it so much worse. When I gave that interview to Julia Reed at Vogue, who was a wonderful journalist who died just a couple of months ago, and she quoted it absolutely accurately, and then she wrote letters to newspapers saying she was just making fun of herself, begging them not to keep hitting me over the head with it. But I did make it. It was accurate. Um, I did spend money. It was amazing to me. I mean, I had never had this, this freedom. I'd always had to earn my money, whether I was married to someone wealthy or not. I'd always had to look out for myself. And suddenly, here I was in this glittering world. And and attached to people who, by their nature, had their picture in the papers. Um, I think that my extravagance became something that other journalists could use to beat us over the head with. So it ignited a media firestorm, and that, in turn, created or added to the atmosphere 
around Conrad. It was a time, you remember, when um, American prosecutors were looking for high-profile heads because of the Enron and WorldCom bankruptcy. Everybody wanted to have a conviction to get the next level as a prosecutor. And I think that the media firestorm around us helped get that prosecution going. It was a, it, it's an interesting thing because it started out not as a battle over how much money Conrad was making or whether he had stolen money. It started out simply, and this was really the basis of the whole thing, as one large investor wanting Conrad to sell the telegram, break up the company, and thus realize the value of the stocks. Conrad thought it hadn't reached the point where it should be broken up. Personally, I think he just didn't want to sell the telegram either, but telegraph. But that was the basis. And the only way the investor could, could get the company broken up was to get Conrad out of the company because he had the voting stocks. And the easiest way to do it in that hysterical atmosphere was to accuse him of wrongdoing. Because just like with the Me Too situation now or the cancel culture, you don't have to prove anything. You just have to say, they did something wrong. And then the person's finished. Well, one of, the th one of the things you definitely learn at a time like this, as the cliche goes, is uh, who your real friends are. Now, you name names in the book, so let's name some names here. Who was good to you and who wasn't? My English friends were good to me. My few close girlfriends were absolutely staunch. Odd people were staunch. I mean, I, I was astonished by Elton John coming to visit me when I was sitting alone in the house in London, never having contacted him, See, you know, been to dinner with him a few times. Um, in Canada, uh, I had less friends because I hadn't really made them. I'd been so busy working. Well, your but hairdresser fired you. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people fired me. <laughs> I Robert was, Gage, very I, famous the, hairdresser. He said, don't come the, in anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was toxic, you know. Uh, um, you didn't want to be with me. And because I knew I was toxic, the people that probably would have helped me, I withdrew from seeing them. Um, I was even a, I was a burden to my English friends because they kept getting called up by newspapers or television producers or whatever to give them anecdotes about me. And that gets very tiresome for people. Um, so the people that I really despise are not the journalists who wrote badly about me. That was their job. They didn't know me. They did a magpie run of the clippings. I can't blame them. And I can't blame them for not understanding the financial complexity and realizing what was going on. The journalists that I don't like are the ones who absolutely out of whole cloth invented things. I mean, I was bad enough. They had enough material to go <laughs> on. They didn't need to invent stuff. And, and those I, I, uh, I don't like. I loathe the lawyers. Um, Earl Cherniak is an exception. And there were a few exceptions. My, my American lawyer that I finally got was wonderful. Our appeal lawyer was wonderful. By and large, people uh, like the person that presided over Conrad's hearing of the OSC, Madam Jenner, these were just absolutely horrible people. And they, they understood nothing. They read nothing. The only person I have a lot of time for was the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she wrote the judgment that vacated all the convictions against Conrad. And she said that the, the judge had instructed the jury wrongly. And she told the appeals judge that he had created new law to convict Conrad. And I really, I really mourned her passing on a number of levels. Hmm. I should ask you, uh, since we are so close to Election Day in the United States, about... Um... <laughs> I see the look on your <laughs> face already, but here we go. Um, your husband and I have had some very wonderful, enjoyable, and sparky conversations about Donald Trump, uh, who I think it's fair to say many people feel is uh, completely unfit for the job, and it's an empirically provable fact that he's a disgraceful human being and uh, with an authoritarian streak, and we could go on. Your husband obviously uh, is partial to his policies and is um, uh, grateful to him for the pardon he received. I understand that. What's your take on Donald Trump? 
Well, we have a sort of Trump-free zone in this house. <laughs> um, and I meet my husband every night for Fox News. Um, and I busily with the dishes. My take on Donald Trump is somewhat different. Um, I think that in spite of his manner, which I find absolutely excruciating, and I found the last debate the most horrible thing I've ever watched. It reminded me of every abusive husband yelling at every wife I could think of. <laughs> but I find that his policies, I'd, I'd vote for him for two reasons. I don't know anyone else who helped the black people, Afro-Americans, that I sat with in those prison waiting rooms. Nobody else has helped them, and he was the first person that has. And his policies, and I mean, it's extraordinary because people don't understand that in Canada. He's been the only president who's helped those people. Um, uh, Afro-Americans are in prison in numbers that they should not be. Um, they've had rotten schools. Uh, they've had life has just kept grinding them down. And I have no idea why Trump decided early on in his presidency that he was going to make a hack into that and really start the prison reform that no one else did. But he did. And he set up opportunity zones. So I take that really as a really remarkable thing to do. Um, do you hope he's re-elected? Well, you know, this is difficult. I suppose I just could not see America under a president that is as challenged as Joe Biden and whose policies, I think, have never helped the lower classes and I think would wreck the American economy. I mean, if I were American, frankly, I'd stay home on Election Day. It's, it's just a, a very, very difficult time for American voters. Even though Trump plays footsie with white supremacists and militias and this type of thing? He doesn't. He really doesn't. Look, uh, I think he misses... I think he's idiotic in not being more clear. I mean, he has, he has condemned the Ku Klux Klan, he has condemned white supremacists, but it's a kind of streak, I think... And I'm just, I'm just speculating. It's a streak of stubborn pride in him not to go on about it because he can't believe that people think he's a racist. And anyone who knows his employment policies would know that he isn't. There's, there's a curiously adolescent quality about him that goes hand in hand with an absolutely instinctive brilliance for policy. It's a very odd combination. But to quote my husband, who I, I often do quote, um, central casting doesn't give you the kind of president you need for, for bad times. Hmm. And America was having bad times, and it didn't throw up a, an FDR, it didn't throw up a JFK, it threw up Donald Trump. And he's not central casting's idea of a, of a great president, but his policies have been, before COVID, extremely beneficial to all classes of Americans. I think he was disorganized on COVID, um, I don't know that anyone else would have done much better because closing the borders to China was a pretty important thing to do. Um, I, the tax breaks to billionaires, I think he gave them to corporations um, and that increased job prospects. But I am not an economist. I can't tell you about that. No, I just remember him walking into Mar-a-Lago and looking at his billionaire friends and saying, I made you all a lot richer today. Anyway, That's exactly the kind of thing he would say. Yes. I mean, isn't it, it's awful, isn't it? I mean, it's the kind of thing that just, it's like nails on a blackboard. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's finish up on this. I, I, um, I got to say, I, the, the very end of the book you write, I'm going to try to enjoy the remaining time left to me and bugger off to the whole damn lot of you. We're still here. You lost. And I guess the, the, the question I have emerging from that is, how important is it for you through this book and otherwise, to show the world that Barbara Emil and Conrad Black can take the best punch that society has to offer and they can get up off the canvas and get back at it? I don't think it's important for me to show the world. Um, it's important for me to tell Conrad that I'm all right, we're here, because you see, he has no problems. He feels that he won. He feels that he was on a mission, that there were as a principle and that he survived it because people wanted him to be absolutely flattened and never be seen again. And, and when I say that at the end of the book, it's really, um, 
It's really a vow of confidence in my husband. It's a feeling that I don't want to think about this anymore. I don't, uh, we've gone through 17 years of this. We've missed 17 years of normal life together, of freedom to think about something other than lawyers and money and survival. And bugger off everyone, I'm gonna enjoy my husband now. <laughs> well, your husband was the first ever guest on this program 15 years ago, and I am is delighted that, true? that is true. And I am delighted that, um, well, it took us 15 years to get you here, but I'm glad it finally happened. So thank you. I'm thrilled. Thank you very much, indeed. Friends and That's Enemies, a memoir by Barbara Emile. In the early going, it was sourdough bread and a lot of cookies. More recently, the pandemic-prompted shift in our eating habits includes everything from family-style food kits to home canning fruits and vegetables. It's been an abrupt turnaround from the kind of grab-and-go groceries many of us used to rely on. And if it was a big change for us, imagine what it meant for food producers and retailers. No need to imagine. We've got three experts here to tell us all about it. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, Sylvain Charbois, scientific director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. In Fergus, Ontario, just northwest of Guelph, Jackie Fraser, owner-operator of the family-run grocery store, Freebert's Fresh Food. And in the east end of the provincial capital, Marion Chan, principal of Trend Spotter Consulting, which specializes in consumer behavior in the food, beverage, and food service industries. And it's great to have the three of you on TVO tonight. And I just want to start, Marion, maybe you can take us up to you know, the proverbial 30,000 foot vantage point and just tell us when the pandemic first hit, how did our shopping, our food shopping habits change? Well, you know, I think that when the pandemic hit, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the consumers were struck by panic and what they tried to do was they, they, they tried to load up. So when we first started, uh, people were loading up on a lot of the raw ingredients on the staples and things like flour and toilet paper. And we all heard the story about toilet paper. And partly it was a, an emotional response of trying to uh, be safe and be um, have everything that they're going to need for the long term because it was such an unknown about what was going to happen, how long they were going to be in this situation. Um, so a lot of people just bought a lot of food. I don't think that they really thought about what kind of food that they were buying. They were just grabbing whatever they could. Um, and so as a result, a lot of the shelf stable stuff like, um, you know, all of the baking ingredients and um, vegetables and apparently frozen pizzas had a big run. So, but the problem with frozen food is that there's only so much space in your freezer. So um, there were, I'm not sure people were really thinking that clearly at the very, very beginning about what they were buying. Understood. Uh, Jackie, before I ask you the next question, your last name is Fraser. What's your husband's last name? Is Roberts. You Which can see where the name Fraberts comes from. Exactly right. Your, your family business is a, an amalgam of both of your last names. Uh, so what happened to your business once the pandemic hit? So it was crazy. We, um, our sales doubled, actually more than doubled overnight. Um, it, we really didn't um, know what to expect, uh, how it was, it was going to, to play out for us. Um, but same thing, uh, we saw the, the run on the staples. So it was the potatoes, the carrots, the ground beef, uh, the pasta, um, and also frozen and canned goods, which we didn't used to were favorites fresh food. We didn't used to sell a lot of canned goods and frozen goods, but we quickly pivoted, realizing that was a market that uh, we needed to tap into. Um, and it, it was it was just pretty wild in general. Uh, another thing we saw in the very early days was suddenly people were eating breakfast at home. So it was eggs and it was uh, bread and it was bananas and yogurt. So a big run on those items. And then about one or two weeks into the pandemic, the, the baking craze began. And, uh, you know, we used to sell a handful of bags of you know, locally ground flour per week. And suddenly we were flour central and selling it by the 10 kilo bag that we were getting in like industrial flour that normally would be sold to kitchens. Uh, we started selling yeast. We'd never sold yeast before. And we were the only game in town for quite a while with yeast. So it was pretty wild. We uh, uh, had to really pivot, make a lot of changes fast. Did you have to uh, hire more adapt. people? We had to hire more people, absolutely. We had some staff that needed to self-isolate. Uh, we brought on staff quickly. Thank goodness we had just hired a new store manager right before the pandemic hit. His first day was March 18th, but he had come from a big grocery store, so he hit the ground running, and I don't know how, what we would have done without him. 
Uh, my husband and I worked all day, every day, seven days a week for about three to four months uh, during the beginning just because it was really quite wild. And let me do one more quick follow-up with you. If you walked into the store, say, a month or two into the pandemic, how would it have looked different and how would the shopping experience have been different from what people would have seen before March 13th? Lots of changes. So we uh, we moved a lot of things around the store so that we could have one-way traffic. So we had an indoor and an outdoor. Uh, we reorganized all of our banquettes so that people could uh, maneuver around in a, in a sort of a certain flow. Of course, we put up the uh, plexiglass shields, started wearing masks. We were spraying down the carts and the and the bins after every use. So lots of changes in the store, and and also the change in product. We really uh, we really pivoted on that and brought in products that we hadn't sold before because we wanted to be want to make it as convenient for our shoppers as possible and keep them as safe and, and try to be as much of a one-stop shop as we could be. Gotcha. Sylvain, again, I want to take the bigger picture look now and draw upon your expertise in that. Before the pandemic hit, people obviously ate meals out at restaurants and they cooked meals at home. What was the ratio, the percentage difference between those before pandemic? Seems like a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, but before uh, March, uh, a typical household was spending about 38% of its budget on food process and consume outside the home. So we were looking at a 38-62 split between retail and service. That significantly changed uh, in March and April. We went from 38-62 to 9-91. Mm. And that's why we saw a lot of panic buying, so this tsunami coming from food service, which was really collapsing at the time, went, that's $95 billion worth of business. It went from one sector to another, and retailers like Jackie had to deal with this tsunami. And the other thing that uh, we should underscore here is the virus itself. Back in March, uh, we went through this moment in time just because we didn't know much about the virus, really. We didn't know how public health officials were going to react to the virus. And a lot of people went to the grocery store without knowing really when will be the next time they'll be able to go back to the grocery store. And that's why there was a lot of stuff going on there. Now, you know, this may be obvious, so forgive me if this is a dumb question, but, but are people essentially spending the same amount of money? They're just spending it in different places? So... A year ago, uh, we actually predicted that the average family uh, was to spend about $12,600 for the entire year. That would include service and retail. But here's the thing, Steve. When you spend money in a restaurant, it's just, it's just not the same money as, in a, as you were spending in a retail store. You, there's a bit of, about a 40% ratio. So you have to spend $1.40 at the restaurant in order to get the same volume of food at retail. And so we, even though food prices are going up three to 4% right now, we actually believe that the average household is spending less money on food compared to last year. Okay, so not such a dumb question after all. I'm grateful to find out that no, not all my questions. Question. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Marion, back to you on this. Um, you know, obviously lots of people, um, I guess particularly, um, well, listen, I, w I won't make any assumptions here. I would have thought that more, the, the, the more single you are or the younger you are, the more likely you are to sort of eat out or eat fast food as opposed to cook for yourself at home. D did a lot of the population have to adjust to, to kind of figuring out how to cook for themselves in some cases for the first time? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that if you were to look at any Google stats, you would see that that uh, YouTube videos and recipe sites and uh, anything that was going to help people uh, learn how to cook a little bit more, they were really uh, very popular because, you know, the millennials, they, they like to cook, um, but they're not really they were really savvy, and especially when they were working all the time, it was really hard for them to um, to spend very much time cooking. So now all of a sudden they have all this time. Uh, they've got all of this, um, all these groceries that they need to, to cook. So they did really take um, uh, take hold of that. And for those with with families, it was part of that emotional. Uh, comfort of being able to cook for your family, you're preparing, I call it the stirring effect, which um, w which in the past was more about taking something really simple. And the, the simple act of stirring made it 
yours. Um, but now it, it provided more of a comfort in this very uncertain time so that people could uh, pr- feel good about what they're cooking for their family and meals became more elaborate. However, if you're a single person, what do you cook? You don't have anybody to care for. You're, you're cooking for yourself, which is, isn't a lot of fun. So there were, there were ways that they were working around it of trying to figure out how to cook larger meals perhaps and, and keeping it frozen. But I think that there were, um, there's a lot of learning going on in, in terms of how do I cook? And this could be something that's going to continue on because uh, once they know how, they can they can keep doing it and it becomes easier and it's not going to take as long. Well, let me follow up on that because at the beginning of this pandemic, it seemed wherever you turned, somebody was baking a cake or baking bread or baking mu- like people were baking stuff, people who'd never baked before. How did that suddenly become a thing? Well, you know, I think baking is one of those things that has, um, again, going back to that whole emotional co- um, component is that it it has that warmth and it's the that comfort um, and baking not only provides you, you know, it comes out something delicious, but you end up feeling really um it, it's a, like an emotional bl- warm blanket and especially if you have children it's something you can do with your children it's something that you're going to be able to um teach um help teach with your kids and keep them occupied so it had a lot of um both you know various uh, emotional and functional components to it that that allowed people to fill in the time with their family and have a result that was was uh, going to be uh, edible. Well, in most cases. Let me ask uh, <laughs> Sylvain about the long-range implications of that. Sylvain, you've got a society all of a sudden that's eating a lot more sugar, that's baking a lot more sweets, uh, and the gyms are all closed. Uh, and everybody has, I mean, most people I've talked to have acknowledged they've all put weight on during the course of this pandemic because they can't exercise as much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, take us down the road. What are the implications of, of this time in history and these new habits that we've created? Well, we've all been unbalanced by what happened. I mean, let's face it, COVID came violently into our lives. Everyone's lives have been disrupted by COVID one way or another. And so, and I still, eight, seven, eight months into this pandemic, I, I still feel that a lot of people are still struggling with uh, with this this unbalance that we're dealing with. And so, and, and our daily routines have changed. A lot of people are working from home. And when you work from home, you're close to the kitchen, the heart of the house, but, uh, you're closer to the kitchen. You're closer to food, yeah. and, and you're not moving as much. Uh, commuting requires energy. Well, you're not commuting as much anymore, and so all these things are adding up. The one thing that I would add to the cooking uh, comments that I just heard is that people will start to garden way more. There is such a thing as pandemic gardening in Ontario the gardening rate was below 30 percent before the pandemic it went up to 47 percent this year Hmm. 40 because of boredom we were home and frankly uh to Marianne's point I mean people wanted to take control over their lives they wanted to feel more food secure and so why not vertically integrate as a household as you process your food in your kitchen, you can also vertically integrate and grow your own as well. And that's kind of what happened in the spring. Interesting. Jackie, tell us, uh, you, I mean, you did tell us earlier about how you had to transform your business virtually overnight to accommodate the new realities of COVID-19. How about um, online shopping? How much of your business before was online and how much of it is online now? So before the pandemic, zero percent was online. Uh, we were, you know, we were an experience in itself. People like to come and shop in our store, um, and especially a lot of the products we sell, like fresh produce. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to smell, touch, and feel. They like to uh, to do that in house. Um, we about six months before the pandemic hit, we had signed on with a third party delivery service, uh, MrsGrocery.com, and thank goodness we were with them because, of course, that overnight became huge. Uh, we went from maybe a handful of deliveries uh, per week to dozens every day. Um, so we were very grateful that we could hit the ground running with with that service. Uh, you know, then we started the curbside uh, um, option, and 
that was, I mean, in the early days, we were doing that over the, the first few days, we were doing that over the phone, which was ridiculous. It was an absolute disaster. Um, so we quickly got a, a specific email address that people could send their orders to. And we were able to keep doing same day curbside, which our, our customers really um, were grateful for because most uh, stores weren't able to do that in the beginning. Um, so thankfully, also, we were beginning to set up an online shop. So we just uh, sped that up right away. And now people can do curbside through an actual online shop. Um, on our website. So it, it did, it totally transformed us from 0% to maybe we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% now. It's still a small uh, component. Um, in the early days, we were probably up around 10%. But like I say, before the pandemic, it was 0%. Mm -hmm. So it's been a big, big change. Gotcha. Sylvain, um, you have a big study coming out tomorrow on some of the changes that have taken place post pandemic. And I gather we have been able to prevail upon you to uh, scoop yourself with one graphic from your study. And to that end, there we are. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, we have it right now. And I wonder if you could take us through this chart, which essentially asks people, how much of a premium are you willing to pay for locally grown fresh produce? For those listening on podcast and who can't see the chart, let me just read out some of the numbers here. 7% of people are prepared to pay 20 to 40% more. About a third of the people are prepared to pay 10 to 20% more. A little more than a third are prepared to pay less than 10% more, and you've got fully 20.5% of the people who say, I am unwilling to pay a premium. Yeah, so the whole idea of this report is is to look at food autonomy. Uh, we've, uh, as a lab, we've been working with uh, a few provinces, including Quebec and, and New Brunswick, looking at how we can produce more food all year round, and if there is any appetite, no pun for local foods. And what do what does local food mean? And uh, and by the way, I've, I've been to Jackie's uh, store a few times when I was living in Guelph. It's just an outstanding store, and I know that they've been championing local foods. But local means something different to a lot of different people, and and that's what we looked at. Now, with the graph you just showed, we actually looked at. The willingness for people to pay for for local food because typically uh, local foods are more expensive not always but more expensive and if you are to use control environment agriculture technologies it will likely cost more and so you see right now that people are willing to pay more for local foods but uh, the other thing that we've noticed in our study is that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually looking for opportunities either. But uh, we're not convinced. And of course, this is all about motherhood and apple pie. In, uh, during surveys, a lot of people will answer uh, positive things or in a positive way. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly what's going on in, in a store. And I suspect that Jackie would know this price is the biggest barrier. I mean, uh, especially right now during a recession, uh, you, ha you hear campaigns like Foodland Ontario advocating uh, or telling people to support your local economy. What is it unreasonable to ask people to support the local economy when their budget has been tightened as a result of recession or maybe they've lost their jobs? So it's this is something that we need to work on, and what I what we've been advocating, we've been telling different provinces that if you are if you are to push local foods, make it affordable. Jackie, what's your experience on this issue of whether people are prepared to pay a premium for more local? Yeah, I mean. Obviously, uh, I can only speak anecdotally, and and my clientele. I mean, one of the main reasons why they shop at our store is because we offer local food. So, uh, we tend to cater to the local boars that don't mind spending a little bit more for local. Um, we did have, I think, of strawberries off the top of my head was a commodity that was, um, it stayed, you know, a little higher in price throughout the season uh, because of labor shortages and everything else. Um, and our, our customers, you know, there, there was some commentary about the price, but uh, they, they were willing. But again, um, you know, I would say my clientele are probably not representative of, of the population at large. All right, let's try another chart here. Now, this one goes back, Sheldon, this is the Angus Reid chart on the top of page four. And this one goes back to May. And again, lots of numbers here. So just leave this up for a second. And I'm going to take people who can't see this because they're on podcast. I'm going to take pe uh, people through this. When the pandemic is over, what do you intend to do more of, if anything? And in the group aged 18 to 34, more than half say they're going to cook more at home when this pandemic is over. 
And that's actually the number one answer, regardless of demographic. If you go to the 35 to 54 demographic, which are those middle bars, again, the largest percentage by a long way, 48% say we are going to cook more at home. And even those who are over the age of 55, again, the largest percentage, 40%, uh, say, we're going to cook more at home. It's a much smaller number. Uh, you, you know, you would think, I guess, that w with nobody allowed to go to restaurants these days, at least in the four major uh, pandemic areas in the province, Toronto, Ottawa, Peel, and York, you'd think that there'd be this explosion of people wanting to go to restaurants, but that is uh, a distant second in everybody's responses. Now, admittedly, this is May. Things may have changed uh, now that we're in October. Uh, but, Marion, let me go to you on that. This notion that people, once the pandemic is over, are going to cook a lot more at home. This trend we're seeing now continuing. You buying? Definitely. I mean, I think that people are going to cook more. I mean, over over a period of time, those people who are cooking at home are going to, to taper off. Because let's, let's face it, the reason that we have convenience foods and the reason that, that it exploded is because it was a it was a need uh, it filled the the uh, the filled the void of having time to be able to prepare your own meals however when people learn how to cook and they're learning uh, it takes the mystique away from the whole cooking process and it becomes a little easier every time they do it and over eight months they've been doing it at home every single day multiple times a day it becomes easier and so they'll they'll get um, they'll have a repertoire of things that they are uh, they can cook easily and they'll be able to do it and they'll become proficient and then they'll increase their their um, uh, their repertoire however as I said before as things are as people go back to work and their daily routines are become more set and their children become um, involved in activities in whatever way that they, they can be involved, time is going to start to shrink and those uh, convenience foods are going to continue to provide them with the, the uh, ability to provide quick, easy meals. Um, but I definitely do still think that there's going to be more cooking, uh, home cooking and scratch cooking at home than there used to be. Let me pick up on the restaurant angle here. And to that end, I want to play a clip from um, this is John Sinopoli, who's the executive chef and owner of uh, something called the Ascari Hospitality Group. We had him on this program several months ago on how restaurants are hoping to survive this pandemic. Here's a little snippet of what he had to say. Sheldon, if you would. I think that many restaurants are going to shift into being more marketplaces. Because you can't fill your space with seats all the way, you're going to want to fill it with product for people just to come in, purchase something pre-made, pre-done, ready to go at home, and um, uh, like a more of a, a really high-end prepared food shop. Uh, because your brand already exists in terms of the experience you provide. Sylvain, let me go to you on this because I was a little surprised that, that the number of respondents who said, yes, we can't wait to get back out to restaurants and, and eat out again after basically being deprived of that experience for the last eight months, it's a relatively small number. What do you think that portends for restaurants going forward? So the way we see food service right now, food service is at about 65% of what it was before COVID. Uh, so we are expecting many restaurants to close. In fact, a lot of them have closed already, uh, in the, in the G, including the GTA. But there's been a lot of pivoting going on, and this is the one term that we've heard a lot during this this pandemic. And restaurants are doing just that. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, food brokering, I would say, also. Uh, we're seeing grocers partnering with restaurants and selling meal kits for restaurants to consumers. Uh, PC Chef is just one example. It's been announced recently. There's a lot of things going on within the supply chain that would allow food service to have access to some opportunities. Essentially, with COVID, uh, we were talking for many years about this blurring line between food service and food retail. Well, COVID has, has blown everything up. There's, there is no line anymore. And I think a lot of people are starting to notice that. Jackie, I'm down to my last minute here. Are you uh, already or are you looking into partnering with local restaurants in the way that Sylvain just described? 
Actually, our local restaurants have pivoted and done fantastically well, but we did reach out to them in the early days and say, look, how can we help you? We're allowed to be open. We recognize that you are not. We're, we're so grateful to be able to be open when you cannot be, and how can we help? Um, a little bit of a side note, we had a local flower shop that was going to lose their Mother's Day because uh, she wasn't able to be open, and we opened up our space to sell her flowers for Mother's Day um, because we could. And so there are ways that, uh, you know, the community was trying to to help each other in different ways, but that that is an excellent point. There were We did sell meal kits for a, a restaurant in uh, in Waterloo for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a, it was a great opportunity for us to help and uh, knowing that we were very fortunate to be able to be open during those times. And Marion, in just a few seconds, do you anticipate food shortages going forward? I, I think that the manufacturers are have been able to gear up. The problem is, is the balance between large sizes and small sizes. So um, how do you how do you get that right balance of um, people who really want to buy bulk and people who want to buy the normal sizes? Um, depending on how things roll out, nobody really knows. Um, you know, how long will the time where we're going to have to line up to get into grocery stores? Is it going to go back to where it was before um, in April and May? Or are we going to be able to kind of wander in, buy what we need and come out? So it, it it's really about size, pack size at this stage and trying to figure out what's going to be the best. Um, oh. There'll still be in some shortages, though, I expect. Okay, you three are done. Go bake some bread or something, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sylvain Chalabois, Jackie Fraser, Marion Chan, it's good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. And since we're in the studio that bears his name, we will add that today is the 49th anniversary of Bill Davis's first of four straight election victories. No one has won four straight ever since. And the last guy before Mr. Davis to do it was James Whitney 100 years ago. It's hard to win four straight. Okay, there is another health crisis in this country right now, the opioid epidemic. Tomorrow, we'll learn how COVID-19 is making a bad situation worse in Ontario's north. Also, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times will be here on his latest book, examining the frightening hollowing out of the American working class. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.